All right, join me on page 316 in your reading textbook. The genre of this story is fiction. Realistic fiction tells an invented story that could have happened in real life. Okay, so there's going there's not going to be uh, fake like there's not going to be dragons and things like that in this story. It's going to be about people, but the people maybe didn't truly exist, but they could have existed. Okay? Monitor comprehension, theme, look for the overall idea or message that is repeated throughout the story. As you read, use your theme chart, and you're going to have a theme chart to fill out as well. So keep that in mind. All righty. Let me, let me get the pronunciation of this from the computer. Tanaika by Mary Whitebird, illustrated by Shanto Begay. Tananika, okay. I believe I'm saying that correctly. All right, turn the page. We're now on page 319 in your reading textbook. Follow along. If you need to, pause the video so you can get your book out and open to 319. Here we go. As my birthday drew closer, I had awful nightmares about it. I was reaching the age at which all Ka Indians had to participate in Tanaika. Well, not all Ka's. Many of the younger families on the reservation were beginning to give up the old customs. But my grandfather, Amos Deerleg, was devoted to tradition. He still wore handmade beaded moccasins instead of shoes and kept his iron gray hair in tight braids. He could speak English, but he spoke it only with white men. With his family, he used a Sioux dialect. Grandfather was one of the last living Indians, he died in 1953 when he was 81, who actually fought against the U.S. cavalry. Not only did he fight, he was wounded in a skirmish at Rose Creek, a famous encounter in which the celebrated Caw chief, Flatnose, lost his life. At the time, my grandfather was only 11 years old. Eleven was a magic word among the Caws. It was the time of Tanaika, the flowering of adulthood. It was the age, my grandfather informed us hundreds of times, when a boy could prove himself to be a warrior and a girl took the steps to womanhood. I don't want to be a warrior, my cousin Roger Deerleg confided to me. I'm going to become an accountant. None of the other tribes make girls go through the endurance ritual, I complained to my mother. It won't be as bad as you think, Mary, my mother said, ignoring my protests. Once you've gone through it, you'll certainly never forget it. You'll be proud. I even complained to my teacher, Mrs. Richardson, feeling that, as a white woman, she would side with me. She didn't. All of us have rituals of one kind or another, Mrs. Richardson said. And look at it this way. How many girls have the opportunity to compete on equal terms with boys? Don't look down on your heritage. Heritage, indeed. I had no intention of living on a reservation for the rest of my life. I was a good student. I loved school. My fantasies were about knights in armor and fair ladies in flowing gowns being saved from dragons. It never once occurred to me that being an Indian was exciting. Turning the page to page 320, again follow along. But I've always thought that the Ka were the originators of the women's liberation movement. No other Indian tribe, and I've spent half a lifetime researching the subject, treated women more equally than the Ka. Unlike most of the sub-tribes of the Sioux Nation, the Ka allowed men and women to eat together. And hundreds of years before we were acculturated, a Ka woman had the right to refuse a prospective husband even if her father arranged the match. The wisest women, generally wisdom was equated with age, often sat in tribal councils. Furthermore, most Ka legends revolve around good woman, a kind of super squaw, a Joan of Arc of the High Plains. Good woman led Ka warriors into battle after battle from which they always seemed to emerge victorious. And girls as well as boys were required to undergo Tanaika. The actual ceremony varied from tribe to tribe, but since the Indian's life on the plains was dedicated to survival, Tanaika was a test of survival. Endurance is the loftiest virtue of the Indian, my grandfather explained. Okay. Turning the page, 321 now, follow along. To survive, we must endure. When I was a boy, Tanaika was more than the mere symbol it is now. We were painted white with the juice of a sacred herb and sent naked into the wilderness without so much as a knife. 
We couldn't return until the white had worn off. It wouldn't wash off. It took almost 18 days, and during that time we had to stay alive, trapping food, eating insects and roots and berries, and watching out for enemies. And we did have enemies, both the white soldiers and the Omaha warriors, who were always trying to capture cowboys and girls undergoing their endurance test. It was an exciting time. This reminds me of, you know, grandparents or even parents telling their stories. Well, back when I was a kid, we had to do, we had to trudge in the uphill in the snow with no shoes on. But it sounds pretty intense. I don't know if, if I can do any complaining knowing that they had to go through this. This uh, sounds pretty intense. Okay, page 322. Follow along. What happened if you couldn't make it? Roger asked. He was born only three days after I was, and we were being trained for Tanaika together. I was happy to know he was frightened, too. Many didn't return, Grandfather said. Only the strongest and shrewdest. Mothers were not allowed to weep over those who didn't return. If a call couldn't survive, he or she wasn't worth weeping over. It was our way. What a lot of hooey, Roger whispered. I'd give anything to get out of it. I don't see how we have any choice, I replied. Roger gave my arm a little squeeze. Well, it's only five days. Five days? Maybe it was better than being painted white and sent out naked for 18 days, but not much better. We were to be sent, barefoot and in bathing suits, into the woods. Even our very traditional parents put their foot down when Grandfather suggested we go naked. For five days, we'd have to live off the land, keeping warm as best we could, getting food where we could. It was May, but on the northernmost reaches of the Missouri River, the days were still chilly and the nights were fiercely cold. Grandfather was in charge of the month's training for Tanaika. One day, he caught a grasshopper and demonstrated how to pull its legs and wings off in one flick of the fingers and how to swallow it. I felt sick, and Roger turned green. It's a darn good thing it's 1947, I told Roger teasingly. You'd make a terrible warrior. Roger just grimaced. I knew one thing. This particular Kaw Indian girl wasn't going to swallow a grasshopper no matter how hungry she got. And then I had an idea. Why hadn't I thought of it before? It would have saved nights of bad dreams about squishy grasshoppers. I headed straight for my teacher's house. Mrs. Richardson, I said, would you lend me five dollars? Five dollars, she exclaimed. What for? <clears throat> Sounds like she's hatching a plan. Okay, turn the page 323, follow along. You remember the ceremony I talked about? Tanaika, of course. Your parents have written me and asked me to excuse you from school so you can participate in it. Well, I need some things for the ceremony, I replied in a half-truth. I don't want to ask my parents for the money. It's not a crime to borrow money, Mary, but how can you pay it back? I'll babysit for you ten times. That's more than fair, she said, going to her purse and handing me a crisp new $5 bill. I'd never had that much money at once. I'm happy to know the money's going to be put to a good use, Mrs. Richardson said. A few days later, the ritual began with a long speech from my grandfather about how he had reached the age of decision, how we now had to fend for ourselves and prove that we could survive the most horrendous of ordeals. All the friends and relatives who had gathered at our house for dinner made jokes about their own Tanaika experiences. They all advised us to fill up now, since for the next five days we'd be gorging ourselves on crickets. Neither Roger nor I was very hungry. I'll probably laugh about this when I'm an accountant, Roger said, trembling. Are you trembling? I asked. What do you think? I'm happy to know boys tremble, too, I said. At six the next morning, we kissed our parents and went off to the woods. Which side do you want? Roger asked. According to the rules, Roger and I would stake out territories in separate areas of the woods, and we weren't to communicate during the entire ordeal. I'll go toward the river if it's okay with you, I said. Sure, Roger answered. What difference does it make? To me, it made a lot of difference. There was a marina a few miles up the river, and there were boats moored there. At least, I hope so. I figured that a boat was a better place to sleep than under a pile of leaves. Why do you keep holding your head? Roger asked. Oh, nothing. Just nervous, I told him. Actually, I was afraid I'd lose the five-dollar bill, which I had tucked into my hair with a bobby pin. 
As we came to a fork in the trail, Roger shook my hand. Good luck, Mary. Okay, turning the page to 325. Follow along. Nakonta, I said. It was the call word for courage. The sun was shining and it was warm, but my bare feet began to hurt immediately. I spied one of the berry bushes grandfather had told us about. You're lucky, he had said. The berries are ripe in the spring and they are delicious and nourishing. They were orange and fat and I popped one into my mouth. Ugh, I spat it out. It was awful and bitter, and even grasshoppers were probably better tasting, although I never intended to find out. I sat down to rest my feet. A rabbit hopped out from under the berry bush. He nuzzled the berry I'd spat out and ate it. He picked up another one and ate that too. He liked them. He looked at me, twitching his nose. I watched a red-headed woodpecker bore into an elm tree, and I caught a glimpse of a civet cat walking through some twigs. All of a sudden, I realized I was no longer frightened. Tanaika might be more fun than I'd anticipated. I got up and headed toward the marina. Not one boat, I said to myself dejectedly. But the restaurant on the open shore, Ernie's Riverside, was open. I walked in, feeling silly in my bathing suit. The man at the counter was big and tough-looking. He wore a sweatshirt with the words Fort Sheridan 1944, and he had only three fingers on one of his hands. He asked me what I wanted. A hamburger and a milkshake, I said, holding the five-dollar bill in my hand so he'd know I had money. That's a pretty heavy breakfast, honey, he murmured. That's what I always have for breakfast, I lied. Forty-five cents, he said, bringing me the food. Back in 1947, hamburgers were twenty-five cents and milkshakes were twenty cents. Delicious, I thought. Better than grasshoppers. And Grandfather never once mentioned that I couldn't eat hamburgers. While I was eating, I had a grand idea. Why not sleep in the restaurant? I went to the ladies' room and made sure the window was unlocked. Then I went back outside and played along the riverbank, watching the water birds and trying to identify each one. I planned to look for a beaver dam the next day. Sounds like she's pretty resourceful. She's taking advantage of all her surroundings. Okay, continuing on page 326, follow along. The restaurant closed at sunset, and I watched the three-fingered man drive away. Then I climbed in the unlocked window. There was a night light on, so I didn't turn on any lights. But there was a radio on the counter. I turned it on to a music program. It was warm in the restaurant, and I was hungry. I helped myself to a glass of milk and a piece of pie, intending to keep a list of what I'd eaten so I could leave money. I also planned to get up early, sneak out through the window, and head for the woods before the three-fingered man returned. I turned off the radio, wrapped myself in the man's apron, and in spite of the hardness of the floor, fell asleep. What the heck are you doing here, kid? It was the man's voice. It was the morning. I'd overslept. I was scared. Hold it, kid. I just want to know what you're doing here. You lost? Okay, turning the page, 327. Follow along. You must be from the reservation. Your folks must be worried sick about you. Do they have a phone? Yes, yes, I answered. But don't call them. I was shivering. The man who told me his name was Ernie made me a cup of hot chocolate while I explained about Tanaika. Darndest thing I ever heard, he said when I was through. Live next to the reservation all my life, and this is the first I've heard of Tana, whatever you call it. He looked at me, all goosebumps in my bathing suit. Pretty silly thing to do to a kid, he muttered. Turning the page, we're on 328 now. Follow along. That was just what I'd been thinking for months. But when Ernie said it, I became angry. No, it isn't silly. It's a custom of the Kaw. We've been doing this for hundreds of years. My mother and my grandfather and everybody in my family went through the ceremony. It's why the Kaw are great warriors. Okay, great warrior, Ernie chuckled. Suit yourself. And if you want to stick around, it's okay with me. Ernie went to the broom closet and tossed me a bundle. That's the lost and found closet, he said. Stuff people left on boats. Maybe there's something to keep you warm. The sweater fitted loosely, but it felt good. I felt good, and I found a new friend. Most important, I was surviving Tanaika. My grandfather had said the experience would be filled with adventure, and I was having my fill, and grandfather had never said we couldn't accept hospitality. Okay, turning the page to 329, follow along. I stayed at Ernie's Riverside for the entire period. In the mornings, I went into the woods and watched the animals and picked flowers for each of the tables in Ernie's. 
I had never felt better. I was up early enough to watch the sunrise on the Missouri, and I went to bed after it set. I ate everything I wanted, insisting that Ernie take all my money for the food. I'll keep this in trust for you, Mary, Ernie promised, in case you are ever desperate for five dollars. He did, too, but that's another story. I was sorry when the five days were over. I'd enjoyed every minute with Ernie. He taught me how to make Western omelets and to make chili Ernie style, still one of my favorite dishes. And I told Ernie all about the legends of the Kaw. I hadn't realized I knew so much about my people. But Tana Ika was over, and as I approached my house at about 9.30 in the evening, I became nervous all over again. What if Grandfather asked me about the berries and the grasshoppers? And my feet were hardly cut. I hadn't lost a pound and my hair was combed. They'll be so happy to see me, I told myself hopefully, that they won't ask too many questions. I opened the door. My grandfather was in the front room. He was wearing the ceremonial beaded deerskin shirt which had belonged to his grandfather. Ngadama, he said. Welcome back. I embraced my parents warmly, letting go only when I saw my cousin Roger sprawled on the couch. His eyes were red and swollen. He'd lost weight. His feet were an unsightly mass of blood and blisters, and he was moaning. I made it, see? I made it. I'm a warrior, a warrior. My grandfather looked at me strangely. I was clean, obviously well-fed, and radiantly healthy. My parents got the message. My uncle and aunt gazed at me with hostility. Okay, page 330, follow along. <clears throat> Finally, my grandfather asked, What did you eat to keep you so well? I sucked in my breath and blurted out the truth. Hamburgers and milkshakes. <clears throat> Hamburgers, my grandfather growled. Milkshakes, Roger moaned. You didn't say we had to eat grasshoppers, I said sheepishly. Tell us about your Tana Ika, my grandfather commanded. I told them everything, from borrowing the five dollars, to Ernie's kindness, to observing the beaver. That's not what I trained you for, my grandfather said sadly. I stood up. Grandfather, I learned that Tana Ika is important. I didn't think so during training. I was scared stiff of it. I handled it my way, and I learned I had nothing to be afraid of. There's no reason in 1947 to eat grasshoppers when you can eat a hamburger. I was inwardly shocked at my own audacity, but I liked it. Grandfather, I'll bet you never ate one of those rotten berries yourself. Grandfather laughed. He laughed aloud. My mother and father and aunt and uncle were all dumbfounded. Grandfather never laughed. Never. Those berries, they are terrible, Grandfather admitted. I could never swallow them. I found a dead deer on the first day of my Tana Ika, shot by a soldier, probably, and he kept my belly full for the entire period of the test. Grandfather stopped laughing. We should send you out again, he said. I looked at Roger. You're pretty smart, Mary, Roger groaned. I'd never have thought of what you did. Accountants just have to be good at arithmetic, I said comfortingly. I'm terrible at arithmetic. Roger tried to smile, but couldn't. My grandfather called me to him. You should have done what your cousin did, but I think you are more alert to what is happening to our people today than we are. I think you would have passed the test under any circumstances in any time. Somehow, you know how to exist in a world that wasn't made for Indians. I don't think you're going to have any trouble surviving. Grandfather wasn't entirely right, but I'll tell about that another time. Alright, thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next one.